sing this next verse. The wind is strong. The wind is strong and the water's deep. But I'm not alone here in these open seas. Your love never fails. The chasm is far too wide. The chasm is far too wide. I never thought I'd reach the other side. Your love never fails. I'll sing that chorus again. You stay the same. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. together. You make all things work together. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. Paul, sing that again. You make, you make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in. time of announcement video. Go ahead and have a seat. Hey, good morning, church. I'm Lee. Let's go ahead and get started on everything that's going on here at EBFC. We always love to begin things by welcoming all of our first-time guests, or maybe you're just a visitor here with us today. We're so glad that you've joined us, and we really want to encourage you to fill out the card that you can find in front of you that is specifically for our first-time guests. There's a QR code that you can scan on the back that can take you straight to our website for you to fill out that form. Or you can fill out the form manually on that card as well. When the service is over, we'd love for you to stop by the welcome desk downstairs if you haven't already. We have a gift to say thanks for joining us. The other QR code on there is specifically to take you to our e-bulletin, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. There's a few things that are coming up specifically this week, and I'm going to go ahead and let Jen tell you about those real quick. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Keeler, the Director of Operations here at Exeter BFC. Just a few announcements about events coming up this week. First, we wanted to let you know that, unfortunately, because Pastor Bill is sick, we are going to have to cancel the Sunday evening service for tonight. Uh, we will look to have it again in October, but tonight's Sunday evening service is canceled. This Friday, September 30th at 6.30 p.m. is our Bluegrass Bonfire. That will be right here on the church campus at 6.30 p.m. The worship team has put together a nice bluegrass set for you. So come on out, bring your own lawn chair, and enjoy some music and some s'mores. 
Then the day after that, which is Saturday, October 1st, we're going to attempt to have a community yard sale, again, here at the church in the back parking lot. That'll be from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. We would love for you to come out and set up a table and sell your stuff. And if you have stuff to sell but you can't be here that day, you are welcome to donate it to the church, and we will put it out for you. All the proceeds for those items would go directly to the church. We do need you to let us know if you're coming because we will provide a table for you if you need one, but we do need to know that ahead of time. So if you would like to sign up, you can do that in today's e-bulletin, or you can contact the church office this week, and we'd love to see you out for our yard sale. Those are all the events we have for this week. I'm going to turn it back over to Lee, and he's going to tell you a few more things that we have going on. So now that we're almost through September, all of our small groups have finally kicked off for the fall semester. And if you haven't joined a small group yet, I really want to encourage you to get some more information about that. You can check out our e-bulletin to see the different groups that are currently meeting. And if you want more information on how you can join a small group, you can speak with Sean McAnulty or you'd send him an email. But like I said, all of that information can be found through our e-bulletin. It's a great place for you to gather, join with other believers throughout the week to dig deeper into God's Word, as well as build some great relationships here at EBFC outside of our Sunday morning services. Every week we've been talking about our capital campaign, which we have some specific information that you can find in the card in your seat. But we really want to continue to encourage you to give towards that, or at least pledge and let us know you're interested in supporting these updates going on here at EBFC. You can give via online during our normal time of tithe and offering, or you can send a check to the church. But check out that e-bulletin if you want more information. The last thing I want to encourage everyone is to find out more information about everything that's going on here at EBFC. It's to check your e-bulletin. It's a great way to connect with everything else that's going on here at EBFC because there's definitely more than just the announcements that we're giving you today. You can check that out on our website at exeterbfc.org slash bulletin, or you can scan the back of that card in the seat in front of you to take you specifically to the sign-up for our e-bulletin. Like, for instance, next month we're getting into our annual chili cook-off and cornhole tournament, which I know you don't want to miss. And there's so much more going on, so be sure that you check that out. I'm Lee. Thanks for catching up with me on everything here at EBFC. Before we continue, you can stand and greet your neighbor. To continue in worship. Let's just continue to lift up our Savior who became sin, who knew no sin, our Jesus Messiah.
as we bow our heads. Father God, we thank you so much that we can stand in this place, that we can sit here and uh, worship you. We can worship you through, through the words that we sing, God, but ultimately, um, I pray that that worship would come out of uh, reflection in our hearts, an overflow of what you're doing um, in us and through us, God. As we pray this morning, there's many needs in this church body, not just here present, God, but those who aren't with us, and whether it's members of this church body or family members of this church body, even those strangers that uh, we may not even know exactly those needs, but God, we lift everything up to you, whether it's a specific need for those who are dealing with chemo, God, or recovery from sickness, or even a broad prayer to be able to declare that, God, your truth and your word would be known among the world. God, you've called us all to some incredible things, and whether we realize it or not, I pray that we would seek your face to be able to understand what our lives would look like in worship to you, God. As we continue to sing and praise your name, and as we gather this, this tithe and offering, that we would see those finances be used only for your glory, not for any namesake of anyone here in this building, God, but just for the name of Jesus Christ, for the world to know that saving grace that, that we get to hear about today, God. I pray that you would be glorified ultimately in us and through us. Continue to change our hearts and our minds and our souls as we hopefully willingly declare your truths um, to the world, God, with our lives. We just thank you for the calling you've placed in our lives. We thank you for the breath in our lungs to continue to praise you with those lives. And um, God, we just love you. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. As those are passed, if you're able, you can stand once more and sing with us.
list of illnesses that I had this week and some the kids in our family as well. So I was assured 100% I'm not contagious, though I am sitting in the back. Uh, but when I get in a coffin fit, there's no stopping it. So we determined it was not best for me to be preaching or teaching or anything uh, this week. So Jordan is going to. And to me, that's an awesome thing. Um, I was hoping more to celebrate having Jordan come up and preach because I think us as elders and myself as a pastor has known for a while that Jordan should get the opportunity to come up and preach, and I believe that this local church should have the opportunity to listen to what he says, because uh, he's a godly young man, loves the Lord, uh, knows God's word, um, and so I wanted to kind of build that up and have that as a celebratory thing, not a, all right, Bill's down for the count, and we're making a call on Friday, should he preach, should he not, all right, Jordan, come on up. But that's the way it worked out. So God and his sovereignty has allowed that. And I'm super, super excited to, to listen to Jordan come up here. Um, again, I've gotten to know him over the years. He's one of the first guys I talked to when I came up to candidate up here. I found him to be a, a solid young man. From what I've seen, a great dad, um, a great son, a great employee, a phenomenal youth director, a horrible driver. I mean it. Do not get in the car with this guy. I love him greatly, but I just took a trip with him. He was a horrible driver. But it's good. You got to find something that somebody's bad at. He's been good at everything, but he can't drive. But, uh, but again, he loves the Lord. Um, and as a pastor, some of the greatest things I get to see is the progression of people in their faith. And Jordan's been a strong uh, believer since I've met him. But to grow with him, to have many different interactions with him throughout the week as a staff member, but also just Bible studies, extra things that we do here. Some other men are a part of that. Uh, it's great to watch people continue to step up and use the gifts that God has given them. And so, again, I encourage anybody out in this, in this congregation that wants to get more involved. There's plenty of opportunities here, and we want to grow the gift that God has in you and give you opportunity to serve God through it. So... Today, I honestly believe truly in my heart, you get the, the pleasure of listening to Jordan preach from his heart. Um, the guy loves the Lord. And so I'm looking forward to this. And I'm going to pray. And Jordan, come on up. That's, the, that's his youth people in the back. There you go. We're going we're to teach them later how it's not appropriate to clap as I'm going to pray. All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, God, it is, honestly, from a human perspective, it's exciting to just uh, to watch other people step up and take a role that's not easy, Lord. It's a massive responsibility to present your word. And um, Lord, I pray that uh, Jordan's work and effort 
not just this week in preparing a sermon and especially the last couple of days as he was really told, um, yeah, you're up. But Lord, his whole life has been working towards this. It's not a culmination of a short study. It's what he's uh, been building in his relationship with you and how you've been drawing him closer to you, Lord. This is this is what happens. And Lord, what a what a joy, what a pleasure it is to, to speak to people about you. Um, but Lord, again, it is it is a weighty responsibility. So I just pray for comfort and peace upon Jordan's heart. And Lord, I thank you for this young man. I pray that he lives his whole life uh, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. Um, I would have to disagree strongly with what he said about my driving. Uh, look, I will take anyone who wants a test drive. Just let me know. We'll drive around the block. Ask, ask Tasker. Tasker in the back. I practically taught the kid how to drive. But, um, <laughs> well, uh, hey, guys, uh, it's a real, it's a real uh, honor, and um, it's a real special day for me to come up here and preach for a lot of reasons, but one in particular is because 44 years ago, I think it was, my uh, mom and dad, who's here, uh, go ahead, raise your hand, mom, mom and dad, raise your hand, <laughs> I'm embarrassing them, well, it's going to get worse, but 44 years ago, they first locked eyes right here, that's where they first met. And uh, one thing led to another, and here I am preaching. You know, I was talking to, talking to my dad about this yesterday, actually, and you should have saw him light up. Uh, he says, Jordan, when I first saw your mom, it was love at first sight. <laughs> That's what he said, and uh, it's just, and it all happened right here in this sanctuary, so it's real special for me to be here, and uh, just seeing the mystery of God's providence, that is also such a great joy that we can look back and see how all these pieces of the puzzle have actually unfolded. And uh, I'm just really thrilled. So even with the, the youth group and me kind of coming in as the youth pastor, you know, it's not something I ever even thought about. It's not something I ever even considered, and I would have never ever told you that one day I'd be here preaching or anywhere preaching in a church. And yet, here I am. In fact, uh, pa pastor, pastor just kind of called me up and said, hey, Jordan, look, we want you to come in, do an interview. And I was like, no, no way. I mean, I can't do it. So uh, one thing led to another. I go in and, you know, Dave Rhodes, where is Dave? Dave, Dave, yes, Dave asked me a question. First question. He's like, so Jordan, what is your, your goal for the youth group here at Exeter Bible Fellowship? You know, what's your plan? What are you bringing? What are you offering? He said that to me. And somehow, I was totally taken back by that question. It's like, of all the questions I should have had an answer to, it's that one. How could I have been caught off guard by that question? but I was. And uh, I really answered Dave the only way I knew how, and it's going to be the basis for today's sermon. I recited 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. That was the only thing I could, I could say to him. And, uh, you know, I think back. I mean, Dave, he's saying, what do you bring to the table? What do you offer? And, you know, the short answer is, I bring nothing to the table. I can't give you anything. Not, not a really good interview strategy now that I think of it. <laughs> it's like not a good way to get a job. But, but it's exactly, that is exactly what I thought. That's exactly what I thought. And we're going to touch a little bit about that today here in these six verses. So I just thought it fitting me coming up here preaching for the first time, I wanted to go through the text that I recited for pastor and the elders when I actually got the position of youth director. So our text for this morning is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 6. I'll read it for you. 
Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servant, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I want to just pray and ask God for help. Let's close our eyes and focus. God, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's a lot said in these six verses. So what I'm going to do and what I have done is I've taken these six verses and I've uh, essentially made three main headings that I'm going to unpackage for you. Because essentially what Paul was just saying here is in his ministry, as a Christian, in his ministry, there is, uh, he goes over the how he has his ministry. He goes over the condition, the spiritual condition of his ministry. And then, I believe, he explains the why of his ministry. The how, the conditions, and the why. And this is extremely relevant for us today. Let me just unpackage it for you. And we can look right here at verse number one. Paul says, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God. So right out of the gate, Paul says, we have this ministry by the mercy of God. It's important to note here that his ministry is something that he received. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because his ministry is not something that he developed. It didn't originate with him. Paul didn't take his great intellectual mind and start this new Christian faith. He didn't establish this new covenant. No, it was received by him. Just as it was then, so it is for us today. We have this ministry, the ministry of Exeter Bible Fellowship, by the mercy of God. So we don't lose heart. We have this ministry from God, so we don't lose heart. Isn't that interesting? Well, how easy is it for us today to lose heart? How easy is it for us to, say, get discouraged or perhaps get demoralized. Pastor, you said it best a few weeks back. I mean, guys, I tend to get flustered when my web page isn't loading quick enough. You know that little circle thing that's loading? Pastor, you know what I'm talking about? It just keeps on spinning, and there I am losing heart. Or my computer updates. It takes 15 minutes. Now, why am I saying that? What I'm saying because, one, I shouldn't lose heart and neither should you, but I'm also saying that because I think all of us in today's cultural age tend to forget just how good we actually have it as Christians. I want to read a passage for you. There was an early Christian named Ignatius. This is A.D. 110. First century Christian, Ignatius, and uh, he was the overseer of, of Antioch. And we read in the book of Acts that Antioch is the location where individuals were first, were first called Christians. And Ignatius is the, the overseer. Well, Ignatius, he got into some trouble, okay, because he couldn't contain himself from proclaiming the name of Christ. He couldn't hold it in. Uh, Well, Caesar didn't like that, so he was captured. 
He was captured, and he was being brought to Rome. And he actually wrote a letter to the Christians in Rome. And we have that letter. I'm just going to read a, I'm just going to read a snippet to you. Listen, listen very carefully to what Ignatius said. He was staring a most certain, gruesome death right in the face. He knew it was coming, and this is what he says. Now I begin to be a disciple. I care for nothing of visible or invisible things so that I may but win Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let breaking of bones and tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. Be it so, only may I win Christ Jesus. You know, I think there's something we ought to learn from our early Christian forebears. What was the condition under which Paul was facing where he tells the Christians in Corinth, hey, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Well, that's the condition right there. The condition was, look, and I know this is not something we would read for an early morning devotional. But this is what was going on when Paul wrote this. His friends were being fed to the lions. They were being fed to the lions, and they were being used as human torches for sport. You see, I think we've gone soft. I think we've gone soft. So how does Paul say that? I mean, how does he say, don't lose heart? Well, see it right in the text. Right in the text we see it. Having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we don't lose heart. That was enough for Paul. He recognized that his ministry he had from God, and that was enough for him to not lose heart. So when his friends were being torn limb from limb, did he shrink back from the culture, the culture that he was faced with? Did he say, oh, man, I better not step on Caesar's toes here. Let me just take a step back and and tone it down a little bit. Is that what he said? No. Nothing, nothing would prevent him from proclaiming the name of Christ. Nothing. Go and die as a martyr. Much of what he written was from prison. Nothing was going to keep Paul from proclaiming the name of Christ. And isn't it interesting? Now I know how it is with pastor. I'm already going off script. (laughs) Isn't it interesting? These early Christians, you know, all they had to do was say Caesar is Lord. That's all they had to do. Say Caesar is Lord and you're in. You're in the club. We'll line your God up with all the other gods and you're good. I mean, why make such a big deal about it? Can't, couldn't they have just said Caesar is Lord and be done with it? Why get burned alive? These are our Christian forebears. Like, why not just say Caesar is Lord? Well, I think Paul addresses this in the text. I really think he does, uh, and we're going to get to that in a moment. But he does more than this. You know, so... He, He has his ministry. We have our ministry by the mercy of God so we don't lose heart. But that's not all he does. He does more than this. He renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways. He renounces them. Uh, Some of your Bibles, I think, may say the hidden things of shame. Paul gets up in his ministry and he renounces those hidden things of shame that you all practice and I all practice. And he refuses to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. Now, this really could be my most important uh, point tonight. And it's one of the most salient issues we're facing today as Christians. This whole idea of tampering with God's word. Um, What does it mean to tamper with God's word? Why is it so important? Well, Paul... He refused many things, not just his disgraceful and underhanded ways, but he refused to tamper with God's word. He refused to twist God's word. 
He refused to manipulate God's word to bring it into line with how he wanted to live. He refused to do it. He refused to water down the gospel. He refused to say things just so people would like him. And I'm proud to go to a church where we too have a pastor who refuses to say things so people will like him. Look, I don't think any one of us would confuse Pastor Bill with trying to come in here and say everything, just say things so we all like him. And I wouldn't want to go to a church like that either. We don't water down the gospel, so why is it so important? Why am I saying, yeah, you know, tampering with God's word, we shouldn't do it. Paul's saying it, and this is, could be my main point here. Well, the reason is because... We refuse to tamper with God's word. This, this is verse number, verse number two here. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. You see, once we begin tampering with God's word, our message, the message of the gospel, no longer commends itself into the conscience of men. So we as Christians essentially make ourselves ineffective when we want to take Scripture, water it down, twist it so that it meets the criteria of what modern scientists say, when we do that, we lose. That's when we lose as Christians. How many, how many churches today are, are doing this very thing? Watering down the gospel, not ruffling any feathers. It's not what Paul did. And how many of those churches are, have 10,000 people in it? Sean, you just mentioned this to me this morning. Jokingly, these big mega churches. What are we to do? You know, this is how Paul conducted his ministry, and this is how we too are to conduct our ministry as Christians. Once we tamper with God's word, we've already lost so that's how we do it. Well, what about the conditions Paul faces? If we're dealing, we're dealing with Paul, the greatest Christian perhaps ever, you would think if there was anyone who would just, you know, have like a 100% success rate, whatever that means, like a 100% conversion rate, you'd think it'd be Paul, wouldn't you? I would. That's not what we see. Let's look here at verse number three. The gospel is veiled. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The gospel is veiled. It was in Paul's day, and it is in ours. And listen to this, verse 4. In their case, the God of this world, that's a lowercase g, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, that's, that's an incredible statement. Who is this God of this world that Paul's talking about? Who is it? Satan. Lowercase g. The God of this world is Satan. And what has he done? He's blinded the minds of the unbelievers. And all you have to do, friends, pull up your favorite uh, news website, watch the news, and in a very short time, you will see very clearly that even the people who are in the, our highest position, the highest position of the land, especially these people, are blinded. They're blinded. But they're in an even worse position. Because Paul says that the God of this world has blinded their minds. He doesn't say that they're physically blinded, their eyes. No, their, their actual minds are blinded. That's a worse condition to be in. And it's so bad because those who are blinded, those whose minds are blinded, they cannot, they cannot accept this gospel. They cannot do it. They can't think straight. And when I hear some of the things the youth tell me, right here in Berks County, 
What's going on at school? When I hear this, we need to remember that the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. The cross and the resurrection was foolishness in Paul's day. The Greeks, the Greeks scoffed at the thought of a resurrection. And just as it was in Paul's day, well, in our day, it's no different. The cross is foolishness in our day. The resurrection is foolishness. So, that's the condition, the spiritual condition Paul was encountering. And I want to just ask, I think it's a fair question to ask. If God has mercy on whom he wills, and he hardens whom he wills, well, what is the point of us being here and and doing our ministry? It's a fair question. That's from Romans. I mean, what is this open statement of the truth that Paul's actually talking about? Well, I think he explains why in a moment. But, I mean, shouldn't we, in this culture that's just going to get worse, I mean, shouldn't we just sit back, kick our feet up, and wait for the rapture? I don't think Paul would agree with that. We certainly don't see it from his life. We certainly don't see it from, from his teaching. So what should we do? I mean, why is it that, that we would, should devote our life to Christ I think the text teaches this. Here's, here's the why behind Paul's ministry. This is the why. This is the main thrust of his preaching. This is that open statement of the truth that's going to commend itself to the conscience. This is it. This is it. Let me read it for you. It's rather interesting what he has to say. This is verse, verse 5. Verse 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servant, for Jesus' sake. Isn't that interesting? So the open statement of the truth, Paul gets up and he says, you know what I proclaim? It's not myself, but I proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and I'm his servant. And we've listened to enough sermons from Pastor Bill to know that that word servant isn't probably the best rendering of that original Greek, is it? I don't know Greek, but I've heard enough of Pastor Bill's sermons to know that that word servant, what's a better term for that? Slave. What's Paul's message that he's proclaiming? This is the antithesis of modern Christianity. It's really the offense of Christianity. Paul gets up, you know what I proclaim? Not myself. He's got a reason to. But he gets up and says, I don't proclaim myself. I proclaim Jesus Christ. Christ as Lord, and I'm his slave. It's the antithesis of modern Christianity. You see, modern man can't take that. Modern man needs to be ruler, controller. We need to dictate the course of action in our lives. It can't be God's sovereignty. I will be the determiner of how my life unfolds. And I'm going to I'm going to dictate things in my life. I'm going to be my own God. It goes right back to the garden, our very first parents. Same sin. It's not what Paul teaches. He doesn't proclaim himself. That's why when Dave asked me that question, I was totally taken aback. Because I couldn't proclaim myself. Because I don't bring anything, and neither do we. But we do have something. We don't have to lose heart. We do have something to offer. It's not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, how many of us can say Jesus Christ is Lord? It's easy to say, but you know it's tough to do, right? I'm preaching to myself up here as well, of course, but... It's easy to say, but it's tough to do. Jesus Christ is Lord. Ask yourself, is Jesus Christ Lord in your life? 
Christ is not going to take a back seat to anything. He won't accept second place in your life. You see, Christ, he's Lord over history, he's Lord over science, he's Lord over creation, and there is not one aspect of our lives that are not governed by Christ. Not one aspect. So it's not enough for us to come here on a Sunday morning and check off the box, that church box, and say, I got my church in for this week. That's not what Paul teaches. That's not what he teaches at all. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's why our early Christians refused to say Caesar is Lord. Because they wouldn't let anything take the place of Christ. Because nothing could come close to the worth and value and supremacy of Christ. Nothing. That's why to them, our early Christians, it wasn't a little thing to say Caesar is Lord to them because that would have been placing Caesar above Christ and they wouldn't do it. And they suffered for it. They suffered in ways that our wildest imaginations, we couldn't even concoct things as gruesome as what they faced. You know, if, if we're gonna be transformed as, as Christians, as individuals. We cannot settle for coming to church for Sunday and then going out and living our life any way we please. We won't be transformed that way. If we will be transformed right here in Exeter Bible Fellowship, well, I don't think that mindset and that attitude is going to transform the church, or even grander than that, if Christians are going to transform the entire world, if we check off the Christian box once a week, are we going to transform the world? I mean, how could we think that if we're going to take the name of Christian and claim Christ as Lord of our life, how could we not influence the entire world? So why isn't this church bursting at the seams? Let me read verse 6 here. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness. You all know where that's from. Genesis chapter 1 has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The same God who said, let there be light, has shown his light, the light of the gospel, into our lives. And that is why we have this ministry. That is why we don't lose heart. And that is why when the irrevocable call of God grips us, nothing, nothing will stop us from seeing Christ as the head over over and above all things in our lives. That's the why right there of Paul's ministry. Why did I, you know, the youth guy, why did I take that job? I can tell you why I didn't. I didn't take the job so I can sit back, kick my feet up, and say, finally, I have arrived. Look at me, I'm in ministry. I don't care at all about that. I don't care at all about that. No, I took this job because the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart. That's why. It's not this argument, why I believe in Christ and God. It's not that argument. No, Christ has inclined my heart. That's the why of Paul's ministry. And that, too, must be the why behind our ministry right here at Exeter Bible Fellowship. Let me close things out. Uh, we, we read in these six verses that if we want to be, if we want to be effective as Christians, if we want to be effective as a church, well, one, we need to renounce our disgraceful and underhanded ways. And we must refuse 
to tamper with God's word. We must refuse to do it. Because once we begin tampering with God's word, we, the Christians, we no longer commend ourselves to the conscience of the very people we're trying to reach. And we are ineffective. That's how we can be successful. We don't tamper with God's word from Genesis to Revelation. So, in closing things out, I think each one of us, we, we should examine, examine our lives. We should examine ourselves and ask ourselves, what, what things are we giving our life to? What stuff are we accumulating that we're giving our life to. We all are doing it. What is it in our life that is replacing Jesus Christ as Lord? There's really only two options. We are going to either proclaim ourselves or we're going to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. So we need to examine ourselves and see what is it in our lives that's putting God in the background. It is uh, my desire here that all of us, myself, and this, this nation, this nation that I love, would wake up from our stupor that we're, that we're in, and God would shine his light on the deepest, darkest parts of our hearts. That's my desire. That's the why behind ministry. And that's my prayer for you and for me. Let me have a word of prayer and thank God, and then uh, we'll bring the, the music team up here. Let's close our eyes and, and focus. God, we love you and we thank you. I'd ask that you would incline all of our hearts to see your supremacy, your worth, your relevance, your value in every single area of our life. I pray that all of us would put you in your proper place, that we would all, all say, with our Christian forebearers, that Jesus is Lord. Lord, we need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close with a, a hymn, but it's actually slightly different um, in terms of the melody. Um, we're going to sing Come You okay. Sinners, and okay. we were talking about it this week. Specifically, should we sing the traditional version or... Um, uh, just try to do it just a slightly acoustic, more gentle melody. So you probably know these words, but I really want to encourage you, like, especially responding to Jordan's sermon that we just heard. Um, the words are, are absolutely true, just a reminder that we're absolutely nothing without our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, so I want to encourage you to stand with us if you're able and, and sing along as you, as you catch on to this melody. But ultimately, let's reflect on these words in our hearts um, as we come before the throne of, of Jesus Christ. Oh. 
there are 10,000 charms. And come ye thirsty. Come ye thirsty, come and welcome. God's free bounty glorified. True belief and true repentance. Every grace that brings you nigh. I will arise. I'll arise and go to Jesus. He'll embrace me in his arms. And in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand. make you linger nor a fitness fondly dream all the fitness he required is to feel your need of him I'll arise and go to Jesus He'll embrace me in his arms In the arms of my dear Savior Oh, there are ten thousand times I sing this final verse, come ye weary Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you'd tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. I will arrive. same God who said, let there be light, has shown his light, the light of the gospel, into our lives. And that is why we have this ministry. That's why. It cannot be one day a week and six days we do our thing. We need to place Christ in his rightful position. Jesus Christ is Lord let us all say that like our early Christian forebears. I'm going to close things out here with the ironic benediction. And then we'll be dismissed. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his radiant countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a great week, guys. Uh, you are dismissed. Thank you.